Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the guests, Patrick Bertinoli, Mayor Steve Bakken, Tiffany Steiner, Jackie Jenkins, co-founders of the Bakken Barbecue, Steve Bakken, Mayor of Bismarck, forgot to mention that. So appreciate everybody coming up here and being a part of this special crude life, living the crude life. It's a live recording session. Now what these are is where we go out to the community, we talk about different events, we podcast them later, we event them later, we also put them into print later, so it gets a nice little afterlife. So we do appreciate that. They're setting up for the Bakken barbecue, and that thing is gigantic. I'm not even, Tiffany, what is that right there? What is that? Who is, by the way, Tiffany Jackie, co-founders of Bakken Barbecue, describe that rig right there. Well, it's from Hurricane uh, Air and Swabbing, I think. Um, it is an old pickup with a rig stack. And I'm not sure what else is involved in it, but it is probably one of the coolest things we've seen at the Bakken Barbecue. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It, they've got a 20 on it, so maybe it's a 20s, 20s vehicle. Should be pretty cool. It's an old style one. We'll, we're going to take some pictures. We'll have it up on the website as well. And we're going to start this off by talking about how oil and gas builds culture and community. And our first guest is the mayor of Bismarck, Steve Bakken. And he's also the host, former host of Energy Matters. And I believe you're the first host, if my memory serves uh, me No, correct. actually, Scott Bachmeyer. Turn uh, up the, is it on? Yep. Okay. No, actually, uh, Scott Bachmeyer That's was. Right. He's, he started the show. That's right. Um, and then was, outdoors. Yeah, well, started with the outdoors yep. and uh, um, came up with the idea of doing an energy program that was uh, gas and oil. And uh, he didn't do the show very long. Then there was another host uh, for probably about six months. And then I took over and expanded the show out into um, the impacts as well of the people who live in the oil patch. Uh, and one of the things I tried to do was balance the message of, okay, where's the technical side for the industry? Where's the information for the layman who must just is interested in what's going on in Western North Dakota that hasn't been out here and doesn't know what's going on? And uh, um, the impacts on the people that live in Western North Dakota that are in the oil patch. And that's kind of what I focused on was um, kind of drilling down, pun intended, um, to the quality of life in Western North Dakota and what the oil and uh, and all the companies that are out here and the buzz that was going on in Western North Dakota, what that meant to the residents. I found it interesting that you know you talked a lot about infrastructure on your when, when you did energy matters, whether it be a, a highway bill or whether it be some sort of uh, regulation going through. But so much of your program was on the building of culture because you know Wadford City was 2,000, now they're 10,000 population, and I'm just throwing rough numbers, but. Uh, Dickinson had, I, I remember the mayor Dickinson saying we don't have enough pipe for another house to be built. Mm -hmm. Not until we can build our water treatment plant and things like that. So yep. uh, before we bring the co-founders of the Bakken Barbecue in here to talk about how this event came about, tell me about what you saw about the building of culture here in Western North Dakota because it is relatively new with the oil and gas in the last 10, 15 years. Well, one of the things uh, in, in you know, people think of North Dakota as being that ag the agrarian state. It, it's about agriculture, uh, farming and ranching, and and then you sprinkle that oil in. And one of the things that most people didn't realize is when you take a look at what the ag culture was, you had family farm or ranch, um, four or five kids, and all but one of those kids had to leave the farm, had to leave Western North Dakota or whatever they would do because the economics dictated that the farm or the ranch couldn't support all the kids and all those generations. What oil brought to the picture was the royalties. What I found was it was an opportunity for kids to come back to the farm. Uh, you may not have been farming or ranching, but one of the things we got in Western North Dakota out of it was a lot of those kids that were a chiropractor or a dentist or an optometrist somewhere else came back to these small towns. That's something a small town never had before. They didn't have a chiropractor or an optometrist or a dentist or um, many other vocations that 
afforded the opportunity for those businesses to move into these small communities because now the family farm could support them and supplement what that meant for having the family back together. So one of the big, biggest changes from a culture perspective was we had an opportunity to reinvigorate family farms and family ranches and bring families together and bring people back into their communities that had had to leave because of the economics of agriculture. I'm going to bring in the co-founders of the Bach and Barbecue right now, Tiffany Steiner, Jackie Jenkin, to uh, go off of what Steve was talking about. Now, Tiffany, you're from Dickinson. Jackie, you mentioned that you've been in oil now for 10 years in a previous conversation. We had 10 plus years. This barbecue is so interesting to me because Bach and Barbecue, everybody thinks oil and gas, but this is the furthest from oil and gas, and this year is a great testament to the community that has come out and supported the oil and gas and and i i think it's so interesting because the oil and gas built the culture out here and now that the oil and gas i don't are there any operators even this year i mean uh, one. I, one okay so we got one and yet you're still having this event it's still going to be probably a thousand or two thousand people uh they're still setting up right now uh record good number i don't know if record number of donations the cookers yep. are down a little bit but Talk about the culture behind this, how it got started, and where we're at today. Uh, Jackie, go ahead. So the Bach and Barbecue was formed uh, between a conversation of Tiffany and I having, we were involved with another fundraising event, and Tiffany and I wanted to challenge, uh, a co we wanted to challenge the other teams that worked in our office, and Tiffany and I started brainstorming, and it was one idea after another, and we came up with, hey, let's have a barbecue. Then it was, hey, let's invite other companies to participate. Then it's, hey, le then let's invite the community. And within six weeks, we had thrown the Bakken barbecue together. And it was amazing to me that we had such support. We had companies sign up and um, some other companies that just showed up, you know, which was a surprise for us. And people just showed up that year. <laughs> they did. And, you know, we struggled with, you know, these little Here's details. Our money, let us in. It's North Dakota. We're all neighborly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, do, do you remember? That was the Williston Basin Conference, too, back in 14. Mm -hmm. People were just yeah. showing up saying, where's my booth? And they were like going, oh, no, it doesn't work like that. So back in 2013, Tiffany and I, you know, eight years ago had created this event. We were new to the oil field but everybody was so receptive to us. They were receptive to the company we worked for. They were receptive to what we were raising money for. And it just transformed into this large event within eight years now. Here we are later sitting here today. And we have such great uh, support from our company, or excuse me, our community. And it's just amazing. Tiffany, uh, you're next. Same kind of question with Rob probably don't have to get into the genesis of the Bach and barbecue since Jackie just took care of that but if you want to elaborate feel free but transition into and and what I wanted to ask you about specifically was this summer when we talked you had 25 26 cookers and now we've got 12 13 but we're still doing this yep. we're still gonna I mean the the donation numbers are up Woo. so to talk a little bit about that so the Peanut biggest gallery. thing, yeah, uh, the biggest thing when we started this, we sent out the invite last year, November, and it was a hit. I mean, we had company after company, sponsorship after sponsorship, and we were like, oh my goodness, what is happening? We had filled this space before February. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were really far away from the Bach and Barbecue. Right. And um, all of a sudden, COVID hit. And then one company after another started backing out. And we're like, all right, what do we do here? Do we still have it? I mean, we had people on our Facebook say, please don't cancel this event. This is the event of the summer. This is, you know, what we look forward to. Well, what Jackie and I and our amazing committee, which are standing out here as well, we thought about Make-A-Wish. Make-A-Wish still has to happen. Kids mm -hmm. still need their events or still need their wishes. So at the end of the day, we decided, you know, we're going to, truck along with this and see what we can come up with and every company that backed out they almost were in tears when they called me because they didn't want to mm -hmm. it was a company decision they didn't really you know it wasn't their decision so we started with 26 we're at 12 and we decided we're still going to have the bash of the summer so we're excited because our sponsorships have never been higher 
So that just tells you, people still have money to spend. Even though oil's low, COVID hit, people are still willing to come out and sponsor the Bakken Barbecue. I want to point out a couple things that I, I believe you two are under 30, right? At least thir oh, you're over 30? Yeah, I didn't know that. Okay. Just, we oh, it has been eight years, hasn't it? Yeah, it has yeah, been. Yeah. When we started it, yeah. when we started it, I was 22 and Tiffany was 23 years old. I was going to say, when you yeah. first started it, you were in your early 20s. We yeah. had no idea what we were doing and either. Way so. to suck up, Jason. Well, no, I just, I, <laughs> would you mind? I'm trying to put my A game on here. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that to me that was really important uh, because uh, they were in their early twenties, and the industry had done such a terrible job engaging with the youth, and that was a big push back then was to engage with the youth. And so here was Tiffany, and here was Jackie that pretty much did this on their own, and I thought that how neat that is. Now I want to transition over to Patrick Bertinelli. Well, well oh, if I don't mind, because I, uh, I, I, I and, and sorry, and this is the yeah. stepping on your toes, talk show host, me and um, <laughs> question. So, you guys started young in the oil patch. Yes. So, if it wouldn't have been for the oil industry, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Ooh, sliding. Not doors. North Dakota. We came back because of the oil fields. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I and mean, I'm, I'm a native, and I was here, and I worked in healthcare, so I, I would assume that without the oil fields, I'd probably be more in a healthcare position than I am now. But it comes back to that culture. Yeah. And that culture around the oil field, that family and that community that that oil culture brings, I mean... Oil workers are a family. Uh, no matter where you are in the industry, it's a family. And, and that's the other part that I always found so intriguing when you're talking that meshing of cultures from somewhere else, from who's here in North Dakota, engaging the young people. So, hey, you don't have to leave the state. You've got a mm -hmm. great career path here in North Dakota because of the oil industry. The way all that swirls together, it, that, Jason, is the part that always really intrigued me. Mm -hmm. And really to go off of that, I wanted to say this yeah. earlier, but the Bach and Barbecue really would not be the Bach and Barbecue without the oil field in the beginning. Without they, I mean, we, we reached out and they stepped up within six weeks. I mean, we asked them to do, you know, unbelievable things and they had no problem saying, yes, we'll be there, yes, we'll sponsor. And the first year, within six weeks, we raised $40,000. I mean, without the oil field, what, com what, what industry does that? None. I mean, we were able to call our neighbors, our friends, all the oil field people, and they did what they could, and they showed up. See, and I tell people all the time that I'm not an oil field generational person. I'm, I'm 10 years in, that's it. I'm an, I grew up in agriculture. I grew up on the east side of North Dakota and in Minnesota, so I'm agriculture, and this, oil field I have never seen an industry build a community literally infrastructure wise and community wise and what they do is they allow the essence of capitalism to really and what I mean by that is they they give back as well as make money it's a, it's a symbiotic thing and the fact that you guys stepped up as a youth uh, really was impressive to me for a number of reasons because you know, I've got a 14-year-old. Back then, it was eight, nine, eleven, and he skipped ten apparently. And uh, <laughs> and I just was I was really disappointed the way the industry w was not engaging with my son. They they weren't on YouTube. They weren't on Instagram. They were running TV ads all the time. They they were hardly doing anything to engage. And so when you guys stepped up, I was really impressed with that. And that's when Patrick came into my life because he was a hustler out there. I believe you came from HR, right? Yeah. The boring Toby from HR, the boring <laughs> world of HR. He gets out there, and he's but he, he saw a need in a community for enhancement. is a good is a good name, but you engage with the youth, and then you keep it going. So the momentum, and that's the part I liked about what you do is not only do you create momentum for these kids, you keep it going for them because it is so hard to get momentum. And then once you get that momentum, man, it's even harder to keep it. So talk to me about how you got involved with the oil and gas industry. And if you want to drop a couple of those kids along the way that you helped, feel free because it's a great story. <clears throat> so I, I spent 22 years with UPS out of Montana, and I was over uh, Montana and Wyoming on the semi-driver side. And uh, one of my buddies that also worked for UPS, <clears throat> he's uh, from Watford City originally. He called me up in June of 2011, and he said, I need an HR guy, and you're it. 
And uh, anyway, those dirty buggers flew their private jet into Helena, Montana, picked me up, flew me back to Watford City and showed me around. And the community was so nice to me. I still remember Angie Pelton, the owner of Six Shooters LLC, saying, Pat, this was nice meeting you. I, I certainly hope you'll consider joining our community. And then they dropped a bomb on me that same day saying, hey, by the way, we don't have a place for you to stay. So anyway, that was a little awkward trying to find a place to sleep that night because there was nowhere to go. There was no housing whatsoever. But the one thing that I saw in just the early years of me being in Watford City was uh, I met the high school football coach, and he's also an ag teacher and uh, kind of part of the skills initiative. And he gave me a tour of the school. And we went in there. He said to me, he said, I just want to get through one school year where I don't have a student tell me that they're moving home. That's offensive to a North Dakota person for someone to say they're moving home. They want, they want Watford City to feel like home. So what I learned from that is I got in with the student council and I told these kids that I said, I'm just going to tell you what I deal with as an HR person. If I'm trying to get a driver from Oklahoma to relocate his family, he says, I'm coming out to North Dakota. I'm just here to work. And then when we find out a little bit more about his family, that he has a wife that's a school teacher and a daughter that's a sophomore in high school, we let him know that, hey, we need school teachers. So we'll help them get aligned at the school and potentially get his wife a job making more money. But I asked these kids at the high school, I said, you know, I found out they all love the school. They, they, they like it. They, they've moved here from all over the United States. And I said to myself, that is such a big sell and a huge value add to anybody considering coming to North Dakota. So we started leveraging that with the kids and getting that message out to workers coming here and letting them know that, you know, hey, these kids are from Minnesota, they're from Montana, they're from all over the country and they like it here. So these kids became part of the recruiting, you know, in the initiative. And so they've done a fantastic job. I've had these kids in front of over 600 workers and they're just saying the message about they like the school. If they move their families here, they'll help them integrate into the schools. They'll make sure that they keep them pointed in the right direction. So it's just a really a, a nice collaborative effort that they've done. What I liked about it is that if there was a push to kind of introduce kids to trades yep. away from four-year universities. Four-year universities were turning into debt machines for a lot of kids to you know get an art history major, and then they yep. got ninety thousand in debt, and they have nothing to do with it and so there was a push when the oil industry boom came in 2010 to 2013 for trades that's what i liked what you were doing because you were a solution to that you were somebody out there saying okay you aren't bluntly saying hey you don't need a four-year degree but hey you're in high school why don't you go take a look at that welding shop go take a look at that manufacturing deal because <laughs> When I grew up, it was it was Gordon Gecko, Wall Street, Secret to My Success, Michael J. Fox. It was all office jobs, go get a four-year degree. And then when I was in my 20s, to get back to Mayor Bakken here, was they were paying my generation to come back to North Dakota because we were all leaving. We were all gone. I mean, I don't know if you guys remember that or not, but back when I was in my 20s, they were paying me to come back to North Dakota. I already lived here. I was a sucker that stayed. But... Um, <laughs> but that that's where we've gone and so I'm not sure where we're gonna go next because Watford City is uh, seems to be like a hub now much like Williston Dickinson seems to be the uh, the fringe because of the interstate so it's gonna stick around and then and then you've got um, Bismarck where the state capital is so you almost got this triangle yep. that's gonna happen so it's gonna be interesting to see what happens with the communities with the investments yep because that's a culture too now here's here's the one thing I want you guys to think about is when the boom bust happened, this was a, Vicki Steiner and I would talk about this. Vicki Steiner is a uh, former state legislator, but I think she's back in there again. Yeah. She's back in there again, okay. Uh, we talked about like in like Gladstone and uh, uh, Richardton and these small towns where your leaders took care of the town for 10, 20 years. Now they got mineral money. Now they got mineral money. They want to retire. So this huge glut of leaders just was like gone over the course of five years. That might happen again. Some of these built leaders we built up over the last 10 years, they might have to go take a job in Texas. They might have to go take a job in Wyoming. So uh, I don't know if we, we, we want to talk about that or not, but maybe uh, we'll start with <clears throat> Patrick because you're kind of seems, you got the mic and we'll, we'll start with you next. Uh, talk to me about where you see your position going over the next several years. Um. Well, I'll just say, you know, the one thing that I'll say Besides is Besides giving yourself a raise. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I just think there's more work to do. Uh, you know, I'll say that I've got a huge initiative going on with trying to get the east out here to the west. 
I've got uh, Microsoft on deck. I've got some different companies out there on deck to come over to Watford City. So we certainly want to integrate some uh, new type of positions in uh, Watford City. So we've got the conversation started there. We're very excited about that. Um, but I will tell you also that, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of these workers that were displaced in the uh, in the you know the COVID-19 and the low oil prices but I'm happy to report that I see some of those folks being you know uh, recruited to new companies and I, I just did an article on LinkedIn about one of those guys uh, top-notch people they just uh, J&J Rental out of Newtown just started a work over rig division in Watford City and they got the A-team they've drafted some very quality people to that organization I just ran into a couple last week that have been in Watford City since 2015 and in 2010 they work for a big uh, uh, pipeline company that company left but these two are staying behind and they're starting their own company Silver Fox uh, pipeline they're gonna do a fantastic job I'm getting those two people in front of uh, city planner economic development next week to have a meeting and also the school because these guys are interested in helping train welding and welders the high schools and, and doing some stuff like that so I'm very optimistic about what's going on in Watford City and I'm seeing those displaced workers get called back to active duty right now Mayor Steve Bakken <laughs> And then we're going to hand it to the uh, next generation of leaders that are here today, Jackie Jenkin and Tiffany Steiner. Steve Bakken, mayor of Bismarck, possibly, who knows, maybe governor one day. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but take a look at your university, you know, whether it be Bismarck State or even, you know, U of Mary, which is a private school. Uh, take a look at some of the infrastructure you guys have made. The legacy fund, um, the you know the amount of money that is allocated from oil and gas taxes to the state, you know revenues, that sort of thing. Talk to me about what do you see over the next several years from either Bismarck standpoint or the state capital standpoint. And I understand you're just you, you know just the mayor of Bismarck, so you're not <laughs> in state capital. But I also understand. Well, I'm Os there a lot, so and osmosis uh, is real. So yeah. it's, uh, uh, talk to me about where you see things from your standpoint over the next three years going. So you mentioned the educational standpoint. I, I'll even back it down a little bit further. So uh, one of the things I have always followed and. If you look at the health of a community and where a community is going, follow the school enrollment numbers. What's going on in that community is tied to those school enrollment numbers. You know, you take a look at the boom in uh, in Watford City. Um, some interesting factors, but they had to grow. Um, you take a look at Bismarck, and Bismarck's booming. Um, I remember, you have to remember that Bismarck's not a... Or, in the previous formula was not a hub city. We were outside of that. We didn't get the state money that out in the oil patch got. But when you take a look at the population of Bismarck, for example, Williston got a brand new high school for 46 kids coming into the school district. At that same time, Bismarck had 450 kids coming into the school district year after year after year. So we had some different challenges because what we were finding out was families were moving to Bismarck because it was a bigger city, um, a little calmer than what was going on at the oil patch in the initial boom stage. And there were opportunities for spouses and children that weren't out in the oil patch yet. Now, the communities in the oil patch have caught up. They, they have fully caught up and, and it's a level playing field now. But we're still growing. Our school district is burgeoning. The opportunities that I talk about with the school educational part though you take a look at you know the energy program at Bismarck State College phenomenal now that they're going to be a polytechnic that's going to be off the charts um, University of Mary getting into an engineering program because there was a need out in the oil patch dialing back one step you take a look at the Career Academy which Bismarck Public Schools built the Career Academy, which now the governor wants to model across the rest of the state because that was the first one. That was the benchmark. And what they've done with welding, UAV and drones, aviation, and all these different programs that allowed kids in the Bismarck community to easily transition into a program that could funnel them right into the opportunities in the oil patch. So when you're looking at our community in Bismarck, having those educational opportunities to coincide with what BSC was doing and what um, 
uh, you, Mary, was doing it. And United Tribes, I don't want to leave them out because their welding program specifically grew to meet the needs in the oil patch. So those educational opportunities and kind of being a bedroom community on the fringe of the oil patch, but still on the interstate system, still on the hub system, you know, the opportunity for uh, the industry to um, stage equipment and stage things in Bismarck that they couldn't get the space out in the oil patch at the time. We had the space. So a lot of those families, uh, the ancillary parts of companies, they moved their families to Bismarck, not just for the opportunities because there was a need um, and there was a vacancy. So you know, when you follow that growth pattern and how Bismarck continues to grow, the way I look at it is we're growing and we're going to have an opportunity to still add value to what's going on in the oil patch and to communities like Dickinson and Watford City and Williston and Minot and the things that they're doing that are more directly involved, but we have a place. And, and that was forgotten in the previous formula when it was hub cities. So Bismarck actually did a lot for the oil patch without the benefit of state aid. I remember when the boom first came, we would say that Minneapolis was the first winner because that's where the finances came from mm -hmm. and a lot of the uh, distribution because of the rail and the interstate. And then Fargo was the next. And then Bismarck. Not even. You know, it's kinda, Fargo you know, kind of got skipped over. Because oh, I disagree. Be because... And, and, in yeah. fact, yeah. Um, the thing I was going to talk to the girls about is um, their their role as the next leaders of the Bakken because of what they're doing with this and how they have already become that, whether they know it or not. You guys are this generation of leaders. Um, and that's important because what Steve's talking about is really crucial about the educational part. And I'm looking at it from a different side of things. I'm looking at it more from like what, what Pat might be looking at it from is getting these kids exposed and aware of oil and gas for every student Watford City added NDSU added eight North I mean Fargo added eight and Fargo is uh, is, is very um, different than the western side of things and that's why uh, Patrick is going to be doing some more of these east and west uh, type of meetups him and I are talking about Start trying to get some more things going where the east and west and I'd like to include the two of you as well Trying to get people on the east side familiar with what's going on in the west because it almost turned into a Hatfield McCoy type of a thing uh, you know like a, a rivalry and Fargo's just it's, it's growing because that's where the universities are and Grand Forks That's where the universities are so it's really important to keep that and look at the program a UND put in specifically for the oil patch and, and the engineering exactly, and right. with the petroleum engineering, but that was because of the investment the industry made and individuals who there's a lot of oil guys that live in Bismarck right. and and they personally stepped up and helped UND get those programs in place for the benefit of the oil patch and I think that's a really important thing to to point out is that there has been an investment on the east side of the state so uh, the kids are coming out now this is great this is great what do you guys make about being the leaders because, you know, wh whether you like it or not, you are. Because th this is the only real event that's going on right now in the Bakken this year. I mean, totally serious. You know, And that took some real leadership, not only to have the arrows slung at you, but also to be able to put this together in a way that is totally new. There's no playbook on this. Mm -mm. There's no playbook. No, so not at all. Talk about it. So, you know, sometimes I don't personally think and foresee Tiffany and I as leaders we're doing something we enjoy, what people we enjoy. So to us, it's kind of us just um, spending, you know, our free time working on this event and networking and meeting people and getting our name out there to raise money for a nonprofit organization like Make-A-Wish. So to me, that's, that's what it's about. It's not being a leader or, you know, having the best idea. But at the same time, it's so amazing what our event has has for come to and what it is now and like you touched on Jason that it's not just an oil field event you know we have many companies he from here even to Bismarck now that like Bucks football team you know reached out to us this year and donated which is huge for us it's not just 
the oil field companies and it's it's amazing how our event has touched so many people whether it's the companies that come cook the families that have came year after year the wishes we've granted you know the people that come here just f to have a good time the n that night Tiffany, you got anything to add on that? And then we're going to hand it over to Patrick to talk about cultivating leaders next. I think the biggest thing is Jackie and I never did this for recognition or anything. We did it to make a difference in our community. And I know we've done that because we bring up a wish kit every year. And that's one of many that we can sponsor. But we can't do it without the cookers, the sponsors, you know, everyone involved. It's not just us. We're maybe the spearheaders but there's a lot of people underneath us that make it possible for this event. A lot. <laughs> I just, I'm still, I can't believe it's been eight years. I'm just. This, Me either. I'm still just. <laughs> Lots of gray hairs later. <laughs> right, yeah, thanks, thank you for that. I was You're thinking welcome. about you guys in your 20s and you pointing out that I got gray hair. Okay. <laughs> Not <Pat>. you, us. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Patrick Bertinoli, talk to me about cultivating leaders, because really that's what you are doing. Um, you saw a need for youthful, I assume, yep. you saw a, a need for youthful leaders because I don't think people understand that you you created this position, at least from my perspective, you created your position. Yeah, um, you know, the one thing that I would really inspire all your listeners to do is I would say that I discovered how important that school was to our community late in the game. And working with those kids, you know, Gen Z, turn on a dime. So you don't have to necessarily go in with, a, you know, an ironclad plan. You go in there, and I'm just going to be honest, I'd like to see industry get into all of our schools and help with mock interviews and get to know these kids. They're fantastic. But I will tell you, the other thing about our ambassador program is I tell these kids, I want to interview you, and I'm going to find out who you are and what you stand for and what your purpose in life is. And I'll just use one example, Lily Olson comes to the ambassador program and I say what do you want to do when you grow up Lily she said I want to be a social worker I said really why and she said well I worked at the daycare and I, I saw a couple of situations where I saw kids get placed into foster care and I think I can make a difference there so as a result of that we hunted down Sandy Tipke in Bismarck she's the executive director for prevent child abuse and then we had I just called her up and I said I want you to come over and I want you to meet Lily she's a fantastic kid and she is interested in helping kids Sandy came over, but we also put Lily in a posi position of advocacy, and we told Lily, you got Sandy coming, go recruit other kids to hear her message. Lily got 16 other kids from Watford City and Alexander to come hear that message, and uh, to me, I think that's a tremendous story, and, and part of her message also is this. If you want to draw people to your industry, give us the work experience and help us figure it out. It was a work experience that helped her figure, figure that out. I want to tell you about Haley Carnes. Uh, she's going to Williston State College. She wants to be a nurse. Why does she want to be a nurse? When she was a little girl, she was in and out of the hospitals when she was a little girl in Fargo and Grand Forks. Those nurses made such an impact on her that 12 years later, she chose to be a nurse. And hospitals don't scare her because of that. So she wants to be a neonatal nurse. Haley also, for her DECA project, um, did a project and she's got a grandmother that suffers from Alzheimer's. And so Haley came up with a subscription service to help families of Alzheimer's because they don't know what to do with the loved ones that are suffering from that. Her subscription service is a, is a box that has treats in it, toiletry items, and a bunch of pictures of their life's most precious moments because she wants to do her part to help those families never forget their life's most precious moments spent together. So these are the things that I'm finding by working with these kids, and, and they're very purpose-driven. They just need us as adults to facilitate that purpose and open the door for them and get them in front of the various people. You also said... Um, you know, as far as industry, I had a few of these guys over at the Williston API, and for those kids to hear the testimony and the recognition of those oil and gas companies for all the great things they're doing in our communities is fantastic, and those kids heard that. And really, what we're trying to do is uh, integrate these kids into the oil and gas industry so they're smart about what's going on out there, but we're also making sure that the oil and gas people know about them and keep their eye on these kids that are going to be coming up and evolving. So those are just some things that we're doing in, in terms of enhancing their leadership. These kids are purpose-driven, and we're just opening the door for them. And yeah, we're going to kind of wrap up here. I'm looking at the clock, looking at the time, and Went and Sons Oil Field Service, a job done right, starts with Team Green and White. They're making ice cream tomorrow, huh? They are. They have enough for 3,200 people, so awesome. we better have 3,200 people here. So <laughs> we're going to kind of conclude with some final thoughts, and we can start with the um, – co-founders of the Bach and Barbecue, and then we'll go to the uh, mayor or Patrick, whichever one. 
I guess. And yeah, we'll end with the mayor. There we go. <laughs> the main event, if you will. Um, but basically, I just I, I want you just to answer the question that we posed. You know, how oil and gas builds culture and community. And the the thing that I fell in love with the industry was how it really gave back. Um, I've I, I've been in the media for over 20 years. And I've, I've covered a lot of different industries, and I've never seen an industry give back to a local community like mm -hmm. oil and gas. Never. Now, I've, uh, medical, ag, I mean, and I, I've seen some wonderful industries. But the way that oil and gas steps up so that every little kid has a baseball uniform, the way that they make sure that a barbecue happens. I mean, you, you can go to a small town, and they'll just make sure they at least have a steel quonset for graduations and weddings. It's not the Taj Mahal, but you can build the Taj Mahal if you want, but they're gonna make sure at least you got the shell for yeah. it. And that that's the part I love, is like they and they encourage opportunity rather than enable entitlement. And that was the thing I've always loved about the oil and gas industry, uh, because that allowed culture to fester. So uh, we'll start with the two girls here, uh, Jackie Jenkin and Tiffany Steiner, how does oil and gas build culture and community in your world? Well, one, I want to say the first thing, if you would have told me in high school I'd be working in oil and gas, I probably would have laughed at you. Because what? That's true. Yeah, exactly. I what? would have said the same thing. And I can tell you I will never, hopefully never, work for another industry because I love the way oil and gas is, the family. I mean, like you said, you look at every baseball team I bet you go in that hockey rink there's logos of every oil field company I know I used to work for MBI I mean they would donate a water truck out to the racing track so they would water down little things that you would never think of they don't ask for recognition because they just want to give back to the community someone called us last minute for the backpack program we don't have enough backpacks how many do you need we make five phone calls, we have five other oil field companies, and we have $10,000 in school supplies showing up the next day. It's unbelievable. It's, it's unlimited what oil field companies can do. I want to just point out something else, too, that is really important in that. They will also tell you no, too, when they don't have it. Yep. So you're not wasting your time getting a bunch of maybes and, and this and that. They're like, yep, stop by, pick it up, or yep. nope, call us next year. And or they tell you to call so-and-so right. because they're going to have it, and they're going to have it right now. Sometimes a no is much better than a maybe. Yeah, right. Jackie? And I just want to add to that, you know, um, the oil and gas or the oil field has is an amazing, amazing industry. I mean, the company I work for now, it's not just we have this employer, that employee. It's, hey, do you need help on the weekends? Hey, you're going through a hard time. Let's help them out. You know, you're going to the hospital, let's send them flowers, let's send a care package. You know, you don't get that in a lot of other industries. And it's not just because smaller companies, you see it a lot, even in the larger scale companies. And it's just amazing. And the, the friendships that you create, you know, a lot of these people become family within the Bakken barbecue or whether it be the oil field. I mean, there's so many great relationships made and I've never seen that in any other industry and yeah, I haven't worked in a lot of other industries, but it's amazing to me how everybody wants to give back. You know, if somebody ha is is needing a chair or is having a charity event, somebody will donate a generator, somebody will donate electricity, whatever it may be. They'll donate water, food, so on and so forth. You know, there's not a lot of other people that can say that, hey, this is my industry that donated this, and it's amazing. I guess a uh I mean, example, last week we called someone, we said, hey, we can't get the spools here for Bakken Barbecue. Done. That was all it took. One phone call, and he never hesitated. He may not have had the trailer or the employee to go get it, but it was sitting right over there today. And that, to me, is a community. It's amazing. It's great to hear these stories, too, because they're real. And it's, you know, tearing up over here and... Patrick Bertinelli, how about you? How does uh, community and culture get built in an oil and gas community? Well, probably one of my favorite things that I've seen evolve in the 10 years that I've been here is some of the folks that I hired as truck drivers back in 2011, 2012 have, you know, natural career path. They're now working for One Oak. They're now working for ConocoPhillips. They're now working for Crestwood. So these folks that were patient and committed to our communities have evolved in just found themselves in great careers but the other thing that I think is important mentioning and I'll use ConocoPhillips as an example but 
We have uh, um, an employee by the name of Ann, uh, Amanda who runs our Kid Stop program. She's doing a fantastic job. We did a little event with the high school where he, we had the athletes write each of these kids a personal invitation to the basketball game, and it was it was just it went off amazing. And uh, anyway, we got a lot of positive press on social media about just that interaction. And I was just recently doing a presentation for Conoco Phillips here about a month ago, and I told them that story. And I said the reason I want you guys to understand this story is that Amanda, that they're being that's being recognized, is the wife of Conoco Phillips employee Brock Jones. So I want you guys as Conoco Phillips to understand that you're making a huge impact in our community by the families and the great people that you're bringing to our communities. And I say that to all the companies. They're bringing great people in our communities. They're contributors. They're, there's fantastic people. And to Jackie's comments, they're very generous and kind. And then the last thing that I wanted to say is that I've had a couple of school lessons in the time I've been out here. And believe it or not, I got asked to go out and do a bus tour for a group coming in from Minnesota. And I said, you want me to be a tour guide? But I will tell you that I had such a blast doing that, and these people were so excited about what they saw in Watford City, but I left that assignment just elated about how excited they were, but I also thought about what have I forgot to tell them and what did I forget to show them, and so my message to all of North Dakota, don't get so complacent that you forget the culture that we've built through the years. It's fantastic. Complacency is a disease, and make sure that you always remember, and if you had to give somebody a tour, and show them around your community, where would you take them and what would you show them? And my big question would be, what did you forget to tell them and what did you forget to show them? My question is, what did you make up? Did you oh. be like, be like yeah, this is where well, I Harold ham bag four grouse. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I had somebody from oil and gas on the thing, too. We talked about workforce development. We talked about the kids. But I'll just tell you how impactful that trip was. These guys start in Medora, come to, North, or come to Watford for four hours. Because of that trip, they now want to spend two days in Watford City. And I will tell you this too, I'm going after the oil companies. I want One Oak to pony up somebody to be part of that tour. We have to celebrate what we've accomplished and what we've built out here. So I want Conoco Phillips. I want One Oak. I want Oasis. Heads up, I'm coming after you. And I want somebody to represent and share just the magnificent things that we've built in our community. Mr. Tour Guide, where did Steve Buscemi hide that money from Fargo? <laughs> that's that's the questions I'd be asking. Just anyway, but Mr. Steve Bakken, the mayor of Bismarck, uh, talk to me about how you've seen it because you've had a different perspective. You've you've had some time in the media, so you, you saw a lot of the things I saw, and then you also have been there from a policy side of things. So you. Uh, have taken it from that side. So how does oil and gas build the culture and community in your eyes? Well, I want to dovetail a little bit into what Patrick was talking about because, you know, when, back when I was doing my energy program and and building on that, um, and I don't know if it's just because of my last name or if people actually watch the show I mean, or listen to the show. How fortunate <laughs> did you get with the timing of all that, by the way? Uh, sure tail cousins, <laughs> haven't met them, don't receive royalty checks, but I am related. So, all right. At least you got some uh, Yeah. Right? Um, so that educational piece that we talked about a little bit earlier and the tour stuff. So I would get media contacts constantly. Uh people coming from the east coast or the west coast and actually one of the guys that reached out to me wound up staying in Williston and embedded for Thomson Reuters for four years yeah. and you know him quite well and telling that story of what was going on in North Dakota to the outside world and people across the country that were clueless what was going on what we were dealing with in the state the other part of that the positive part of that is the more people came, the more they went, well, that's not what we're being told. Right. That, 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 that's, it's not this dirty industry that, w wait a minute, this isn't what I expected. You know, and, and I always tell people, it's like, okay, here, you need to go here, 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 talk to this person, this person, this person. Tom Rolstead up in Williston was a great resource. Um, now Lieutenant Governor, a uh, friend of mine, uh, former Mayor Brent Sanford, another great resource. Um, you know, we had resources battered around uh, the Bakken a and I would line up everybody to go see this and, and everybody that would talk to me afterwards went it's not what I expected I, I, I had no idea so that educational piece and getting that word out that this is what the industry does and this is what the industry does to communities and can bolster communities when you know you go back to our generation and 
there were no choices. We all left the state of North Dakota. You graduated and you got out of here as quick as possible because there weren't opportunities here. And, and most often, people flock to Minnesota, which... Uh, but that reverse exodus coming back to North Dakota, for me, is phenomenal. Now you take a look at what the industry is doing, where we've grown out the educational portions and connected with the youth in the state of North Dakota. And you go back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and the industry wasn't looking in the state for, for the workforce. They were looking everywhere else. They were transitioning people who weren't from North Dakota, didn't understand the North Dakota culture, definitely didn't understand the North Dakota winners. Uh, and, and how long did they stay? You, you, you take a look at the, the number of people that came and left and came and left seasonally as well, and now the industry has a more steady workforce. They have people who are invested in the state because they grew up here. And I'm not to slight anybody that comes from out of state to work in North Dakota, but having a higher percentage of those who understand, mostly the winners in North Dakota, understand what it is to grow up here and be part of the community in the state, the culture of the state, wow, does that benefit uh, the industry? I mean, that improves your workforce tenfold. I mean, that's an exponential growth factor. So being able to bring some of that institutional knowledge that other workers from out of state bring into the state and tie them into the educational pieces like Patrick's doing up in Williston and bring that institutional knowledge to our kids here in North Dakota, that's a bright future. And you got a couple of people over here that are the future and know how to tie into the youth. That's what we need in North Dakota. And it's actually the present because here we are, the Bakken barbecue. I was just smelling the, somebody's getting going. It's uh, I'm smelling something cooking already. Time I want to eat. smell ice cream. It's, it's <laughs> by the way, how how pumped is that tomorrow? Went and Sons is doing ice cream. Thirty well, two hundred thousand pounds of ice. And it was, so, wow! It was only yeah. one hundred and forty. Well, no wonder it's at the ice rink. Today, so. Yeah, it's at the ice rink. We had to stop the ice rink to get ice for this. <laughs> right. So. Well, that's going to do it for this, folks. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you for coming down. Mayor thank Bakken, you, thank you very much. Tiffany Steiner, Jackie thank Jenkins, thank, thank you. you. And everyone who joined us out here, thank you very much. Let's get back to our barbecue festivities. This is the end of the live recording session. My name is Jason Spies. Goodbye. Open window came, like Sinatra in a younger day, pushing the town away, away. Hey, oh, mama, mine to the night. Hey, oh, mama, hey, life in a northern town. Sat on the stony ground He took a cigarette out And everyone else came down To listen It was a winter 1963 It felt like the world would freeze With John F. Kennedy And the Beatles Yeah, yeah Hey, oh, my, my, my He would never wave goodbye, wave goodbye. See it written in his in eyes his The train eyes. rolled out of sight Right by Hey, oh, my, 
Northern town.